US and Canada. It's 2.30 p.m. in London, 3.30 in the afternoon in Europe. Good afternoon to our colleagues in Europe. It's 7 p.m. in India, 9.30 p.m. in Singapore, Malaysia. Good evening to our colleagues in Asia. And at 12, at 11.30 p.m., it's well past bedtime for our colleagues in Australia. Uh, a very warm welcome to all our colleagues. I'm Dr. Anupam Sibyl. I'm the president of GAPIO. I work as a pediatric gastroenterologist and I'm the group medical director of the Apollo Hospitals Group. For those who are joining for the first time, the Global Indian Physicians COVID-19 Collaborative was established on 11th April to bring together 1.4 million physicians of Indian origin across the globe on one platform. GAPIO now has members from 49 countries and this collaborative is a very vibrant, dynamic body that has seen some amazing exchange of knowledge over the last few months. COVID-19, as we know, has been reported from more than 200 countries and territories, 19.5 million cases and sadly 724,466 deaths. An explosion of knowledge has taken place like never before. Uh, as of today, there are 38,523 publications on PubMed, which works out to 173 papers per day because COVID is only 222 days old. And there are 2,015 papers on COVID published from India. Today, we'll be demystifying lab diagnosis of COVID-19. We have a distinguished group of experts from across the globe. And let's start by inviting Dr. Sudhakar Jonalagada for his opening remarks. Sudhakar is a dear friend, a distinguished uh, gastroenterologist and a transplant hepatologist. Uh, he works in Georgia. Dr. Sudhakar took over as the president of the American Association of Physicians of Indian Origin, API, on 11th of July. Over to you, Sudhakar. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sibal, and good evening and good morning to U.S. friends. Friends, as you all know, the cry of humanity caused by this pandemic is very sad, dark, and deafening. In this sad, dark, and deafening chaos, allow me to inform, invoke, and invite. Inform you all the situational and RP perspective, invoke the eternal wisdom that has guided the people in distress time and time again. Invite the brilliant expert to share up to date information to diagnose the deadly pandemic. We are all trying to practice practice based medicine, evidence based medicine, with these strange diseases with a lack of clarity because of the quality and quantity of evidence. With the myriad of presentation, the lab testing options, and prevention strategies and treatment options and supply care chain issues and panic becoming an exhausting stress to the medicine and public policy. We, the team of RP, are very confident that the timely action, hope, and medical community will, will emerge stronger than adversity with the spirit of enthusiasm. RP spread the useful mean of information through the form of webinars in the United States. We, the team of RP, are saddened by the loss of loved ones and in the, in the line of duty and extend the deep and heartfelt sympathies to all their loved ones. Secondly, allow me to invoke age-old wisdom. Asatoma, Sadgamaya, Tamasoma, Jyotirgamaya, Mrichoma, Amutangamaya, Om Shanti Shanti. The meaning is, untruth lead us to the truth, darkness lead to the light, and death lead to the immortality. I pray that truth, the light, the immortal spirit of humanity shall grant us the shanti, the peace. I welcome and applaud this initiative of GAPIO and global Indian physicians in COVID-19 fight, bringing the such truth, the light in the, to the frontline providers all over the world, I request them to continue to bring out the more, many valid and valuable topics. I welcome and knowledge be our path, preservance be our engine, and hope is our fear. We can reach any of our goals. Finally, allow me to invite the blend experts to present the updated information and a synopsis on the relevant and important topic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Sudhakar, for your opening remarks. The, the contribution of you as a leader of API is very valuable to this collaborative. Yourself, Suresh, the president, Anupama, and Ravi and the entire leadership, and of course, Dr. Sudhir, who, of course, 
uh, has the api and the gapio hats on have played a stellar role and of course huge amounts of contribution from canada from sins kapi from australia imja from bapio so together we are very strong and thank you so much sudhakar and i am now going to uh, introduce my dear friend dr sudhir parekh uh, sudhir bhai is a pulmonologist and expert in asthma and allergy in new jersey he is the chairman and publisher of parekh worldwide media which is the largest publication and broadcasting house globally for non resident indians uh, and he also owns itv gold channel um sudhir bhai is the secretary general of gapia Gapio has had multiple awards come his way: the Padam Shri, the Pravasi Bharatiya Samman, the Ellis Island Medal of Honor, and the Knights, the title of the Knights of Malta. Oh, good evening. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, thank you, Anupam. Uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Welcome to this uh, great uh, Gapio initiative of uh, COVID uh, webinar, and really, we really brought the Uh, knowledge of the covid to the throughout the world and everyone appreciated lot now it's my privilege and uh, honor to introduce uh, dr nikhil bayani he is a consultant in infectious disease and a system professor in internal medicine at uh, uh, university of uh, uh, texas and university of the north texas uh, health and science usa Dr. Nikhil is also chief of uh, department of the quality, patient safety, and infection prevention at at the Arlington, Texas. Dr. Nikhil has uh, 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 won uh, qu- several uh, uh, awards uh, in last uh, few years. So let's welcome uh, Dr. Nikhil Bayani. Dr. Nikhil, thank you very much, and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Thank you very much, Dr. Parikh. Um, I just, on a little side note, I know you very well, Dr. Parikh, because your family members in Salt Lake City are very good friends. Your sister is very good friends with my parents, and we have Thank met you. nearly 30 years ago at one of your at your sister's 25th wedding anniversary party. So yes, it's an honor yes. to be recognized. And once again, good afternoon. Good morning. Good afternoon, and good evening to distinguished physicians around the. Uh, world. Now, will I be able to share my screen here? Yes, you have access. Please go ahead. Okay. Thank you. All right. All right. Can everyone see my screen? No. Thank you. Can you see the? Can you yes. see it? We can see you <clears throat> and your lovely. You can Oh, red t-shirt, but we can't see the slides. <laughs> just one minute. Boy. Yeah, there we are. So you just need to get to your presentation. Okay. Do you see the presentation yet? No. No, you haven't memorized it on on your screen, have you? Hmm. Uh, oh, here we go. Now you can see it. Yes, we can. Nice. All right. So do we get the full screen? Yeah. Thank you. And all right. So here we are. I'm going to be talking about you know the COVID-19 testing and one of the the details around this presentation is what we are doing at our institutions here at Texas Health Resource and of course you know the role of the RT-PCR and the nucleic acid amplification testing. So of course this was a graph I put together early on during the pandemic because there was a lot of concerns from patients and this is the first time where physicians had to listen to patients and as we listened to the patients we cared about our patients we assured our patients the patient experience of course improved and one of the ways the patient experience improved is by knowing how we're going to be testing for this emerging disease So I put this table together and it's a quick summary here there are nucleic acid amplification tests and um the primary clinical use of course is the diagnosis of the current infection and the big question comes up here which specimens are adequate are we talking about nasal pharyngeal swabs or pharyngeal swabs nasal swabs 
and nasal or nasopharyngeal washes. Of course, you know, when we order these tests, we always wonder how well they're going to perform. The analytic sensitivity specificity in ideal settings, the clinical performance depends on the type and quality of the specimen duration of illness at the time of testing. Initially, we had patients who came to the hospital earlier in the presentation. Clinically, they are acting like COVID patients. However, the tests have been negative. And that became a real frustrating and challenging part. And as I move on the presentation here at Texas Health Resources, what we have done, we came up with a treatment algorithm, which really helped alleviate some of these, you know, false, you know, testing results. And of course, you know, the false negative tests, you know, have resulted from ranges of less than 5% to 40%, depending on the test used. And when I talk about the RT-PCR, the false negative rates definitely go down because the cycle threshold um, the number of cycles in the RT-PCR needed to amplify the RNA has actually shown to be far better in terms of false negative rate. So, of course, the time to perform these tests range from 15 minutes. The turnaround time, of course, is influenced by the test used and the laboratory workflow. And, of course, definitely that includes human power in the lab. The RT-PCR, there are various RT-PCRs assays used around the world. The different assays amplify to detect different regions of the SARS-CoV-2 genome. They target two or more genes, including the nucleocapsid, envelope, and spike genes, and regions in the first open reading frame, including the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. Accuracy of these tests have not been systematically evaluated, and like I said, the false negative rates have ranged from less than 5 to 40 percent. And this was published in the World Health Organization. And this is what we use here as our RT-PCR platform at Texas Health. This is one of them. Um, this is in lab. It's a uh, from Abbott. It is an it uses the Alinity platform. It allows us to provide a simple workflow, and it's more efficient. And we increase the testing volume because we have a large number of entities within our health system. We needed something a little bit more efficient. So far, the Alinity has been highly efficient, almost we have a turnaround time of, you know, two hours. And of course, these tests are available in the United States under the FDA, under the emergency use authorization, and hence the validity of these tests have not been fully proven. The next platform that we do use in our lab, and probably recently in India, this has emerged is cartridge-based nucleic acid amplification testing. Cepheid, the gene expert, of course, has gained fame on identification rifampin resistance and tuberculosis, and the same technology has carried over into the detection of SARS-CoV-2. The test provides rapid detection of the current pandemic. You can have results as soon as 30 minutes with less than a minute of hands-on time to prepare the sample. So really not much is done for preparation. Rather, you have results in 30 minutes. And we have observed that in our um, clinical setting here, that these results using the Cepheid's gene expert system, the results are available in a timely manner. Now, the laboratory-based nucleic acid amplification, amplification test is more sensitive than the point of care NAT testing, which we also implement in the form of the Abbott's ID Now test. Now, this is an algorithm we have put together for our clinicians. And as you can see in the top left corner, when the person comes into the emergency room, now this is for our inpatients requiring admission. If they come into the hospital, the first test they received is a molecular point of care test. As we know, the sensitivity is not as high. How, I mean, sorry, specificity is not as high as the PCR, but it is a sensitive test. So if this is positive, Within 15 minutes, we know this person is going to be in our, what we call droplet plus appropriate PPEs used, and they would be cohorted to a COVID unit. Now, if the test is negative and the clinician feels that there is an index of suspicion for COVID-19, we assess the clinical risk factors for COVID-19. Of course, if there's no alternative diagnosis, they come from a long-term post-acute care facility like a nursing home or a skilled nursing facility, a rehab facility, memory care unit, 
have they had COVID, have, been, have they been exposed to a COVID positive patient, meaning none of them were masked? Could this be a healthcare worker who did not use the appropriate PPE? Then we request for a high sensitivity molecular test in the form of, you know, RT-PCR or even the Cephi gene expert. And if that is, of course, positive, then the patient is treated as a COVID positive patient. But then if it is negative, they are treated as a presumptive COVID negative patient because no test is, you know, definitive. Nothing, nothing supersedes clinical judgment. Therefore, our infectious disease consultant would be, um, would be requested for advice to determine if isolation is needed. And of course, if the test is negative, they're a COVID negative patient. And with every testing, of course, you know, this is a clinical case that came up just two days ago that I was seeing this patient with end-stage renal disease, a 44-year-old male with end-stage renal disease on hemodialysis, presented with fever, cough, shortness of breath, and weakness for three to four days. Now, the patient's daughter tested positive for SARS-CoV-2. The patient lived, actually the daughter and her boyfriend lived with the patient. Physical examination, vitals were stable. Patients on two to three liters of supplemental oxygen. Everything was normal except the lungs. Patient had diffuse crackles at the base. The CT scan of the chest showed your typical COVID-19 imaging, ground glass opacities. The point of care test, the rapid um, SARS-CoV-2 via NAT was negative. The patient was kept in droplet plus due to the fact Patient had high suspicion for COVID-19. Patient was, of course, treated with Decadron, anticoagulation, zinc, and vitamin C. Tocilizumab and remdesivir were not um, entertained just because the patient was clinically well and was requiring only two liters of oxygen. Now, of course, the question comes up, do we further test this patient? And this is a question that was posed, posed to me. And following the algorithm we have, we pursued further testing. We need to determine a diagnosis, of course, to also the question comes up, do we need to take this patient off isolation if further testing is negative? That way we can preserve our PPE. The patient was, used, was tested using the SARS-CoV-2 RT-PCR platform by Abbott, and the result was the SARS-CoV-2 RT-PCR was positive. So what we can take home with this is the patient probably did not have a high viral burden for the rapid testing to pick up the viral particles, even though clinically the patient was behaving like a COVID patient. So take it a step further, we took this to the RT-PCR platform. And of course, what's very important is a cycle threshold. Now, of course, I never got in touch with the lab to find out how many number of cycles were run to amplify the RNA, because in the literature, it's been shown that cycle threshold has not really been, has not provided much clinical certainty. However, it would be very interesting from a diagnostic standpoint that the number of cycle thresholds helps amplify the RNA virus. So obviously the RT-PCR is the best test that we have at this point, given the fact that we're able to amplify this virus. And that is my presentation. Thank you very much. Anupam, you're still muted. Oh, he's muted. <laughs> we can't hear you, sir. No, still can't hear you, Anupam. We can't hear you, sir.
Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I see that there is a, a slight uh, issue with uh, Dr. Anubam Sibal's uh, microphone. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nikhil Bhani. Uh, and thank you very much, Dr. Sudhir. Uh, now I introduce uh, Dr. Naveen Dang. Dr. Naveen Dang is an alumni of Delhi University, Postgraduate Institute, Chandigarh, and All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. He is a recipient of Dr. B.C. Roy National Award for his contribution in the social medical field. Dr. Naveen is director of Dang's lab, New Delhi, which was started in 1985. Dr. Dang is known for his pioneering quality in the field of in the field of diagnosis in India. Uh, Dr. Jan and Dr. Jan Dang, may I request you to please introduce the next speaker? Thank you, Dr. Tandon. I hope you can hear me now. Um, it's a big, indeed my pleasure to introduce today. Dr. Tamani is a senior consultant, head of microbiology, and in charge of infection control in a polo group of hospitals in Hyderabad. She's a trained mycologist and works along with WHO integrated program in PGI Chandigarh. Along with being a good, competent, and efficient and a well-acknowledged microbiologist, she's also uh, has done an advanced management program from ISP Hyderabad. Dr. Atamani is also involved in various quality control programs and is working towards quality improvement and sustenance of quality labs and all the process of improvement of, of different quality aspects, projects, and different parts of the country. Dr. Atamani has also the privilege of having written a large number of present papers and presentations in national and international countries. Dr. Atamani, it's indeed an honor and privilege to introduce you. I would request you to speak on antigen testing. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dan. And uh, good evening, good afternoon, and good morning to everyone. Uh, I'll just uh, share my screen. Is it visible? Can you see my screen? Not yet, no. ma'am. Yes? We're not. No? Now? Yes, we can. Now we can. So go ahead, Ratna. Uh, so uh, I'm going to talk about antigen testing uh, for the diagnosis of uh, COVID-19. So as you know that rapid diagnostic, this for the antigen detects the presence of viral proteins and the antigens detects are expressed only when the virus is actively multiplying. So this depends on the time of onset of the infection, the concentration of the virus or the load of the virus which is present in the sample, the type of the sample or the quality of the sample collected and uh, as per the experience of the WHO, it has been seen along with the uh, other uh, influenza viruses, the sensitivity of these tests varies between 34 to 80 percent. So the antigen detection basically uh, either picks up spike proteins or the nuclear proteins. So the test which is being used in India and which was first approved in India uses the spike proteins. The spike proteins are basically big in size. So they don't have to be amplified and they can be picked up faster. And the sample is nasopharyngeal swab because that is where the virus concentration is maximum. The, just briefly about the principle of the testing, it uses artificially produced antibodies against the spike proteins which are actually incorporated or immobilized on a nitrocellulose membrane. And once the nasopharyngeal swab is collected and uh, there are reagents provided with it and the sample is put on this, it's a card test, so it's put on a card. If the virus is present, it goes and binds and a color band uh, appears. As you can see, I have put two examples. So one is a positive test and one is a negative test. So basically, it's a very simple card test. So what are the advantages of antigen testing? As you can see, it's a rapid test. You, you get a report within 15 to 30 minutes. It is highly specific. 
so that we know that if it is positive the rapid antigen test is positive we are sure that it is 100% positive another advantage is that the expertise for performing the test is not required unlike the rt pcrs where a molecular biologist has to be there for performing this test as it's a simple card test and anyone can be trained a medical person can be trained to do it and since it is rapid turnover time so it can be done in huge number simple test so mass testing can be done and another advantage is that there is no complex equipment which is required we don't need a special reader we don't need a special cycler so it's just a visible interpretation of a test and the most important thing is decentralization of the testing so the lab is not burdened so it's a point of care testing which will help you can suppose there are areas in india where a uh, complex or a high end labs are not available in those places the approachability to these remote areas is can be done and a rapid antigen testing can be done for these cases and we can definitely identify those who are positive well no any diagnostic test none of them are 100% perfect so each of them have their own limitations and similar is with the antigen testing the main important thing is it can be detected only when as i said when the virus is multiplying that is in the early stage of the infection and since antigen testing doesn't involve amplification unlike the pcr testing where you are testing the genetic uh, material which is amplified so even little amount of uh, the virus uh, genetics is present rna is present it gets multiplied and picked up so that detects its sensitivity whereas in an antigen testing uh, the viral load makes a lot of difference if there is a good viral load or a high viral load present it becomes highly sensitive whereas if it is a low viral load or a moderate viral load the sensitivity might be low and this leads to a false negative result that is why sensitivity compared to the rt pcr is less and as i said the viral load is very very important so there is very chance of getting a high false negative the kits which are being used presently have very high specificity 100% specificity so a positive is definitely positive but the sensitivity varies between 50 to 84% so these are the limitations with the antigen testing i know this is a very busy slide but i have put together the recent other two kits which have also been approved by the icmr the first kit was approved was the standard q now subsequently there are two more vernis indigenous in made in india and other is from belgium and on the right side you can see the algorithm or the interpretations for these rapid diagnostic tests from find it's a beautiful article and as you can see it depends on the prevalence of the infection in the community in the states where there is a high pretest probability or the prevalence is high how do you interpret this test so if it's a true positive that means you know that 100% sensitivity it is picked up a true negative you know that definitely the patient is not having an infection a false positive happens when there is a cross reaction with any other virus usually none of them cross react with any of the substances or any other viruses except for sars which is actually not present at least in different part many parts of the country and not present in many parts of the world actually it only cross reacts mildly with sars and fast negative is the one which is the most concerning thing about the antigen testing so the best strategy for using it the first thing is that the implementation i am sure many of you have seen the advisory from the icmr so what i have not put the algorithm here but icmr says that you do a testing for an antigen in your emergency areas or in the areas where you are having a high uh, uh, infection rates and if you get a positive you know it is 100% positive and you need not do a confirmatory test if it is a negative and it's a symptomatic patient then you need to go in for a molecular testing or a rt pcr testing if it's a a symptomatic patient but still if it is in a area where the containment zones or as i said suppose in some parts of our country there are high rates high infections going on in those areas the follow up of the patient needs to be done we might have to take a call whether we put this patient in an isolation and then retest these patients with a pcr or with an antigen testing because the viral load detects and uh, it actually defines how sensitive this test is going to be so the strategy for using it is first is implementing it as per the icmr use it for triaging the patients when the patients come we know that we have 
a limited number of beds available for the covid patients and uh, for the we have to have a segregation for non covid patients so when you do it in the triaging and you identify patients who are positive you can prevent the infection from spreading second thing is we can immediately prioritize and keep these patients in the isolation units and those patients whom you are sure that it is negative those patients go into the normal pool any doubt or any symptomatic patients then we go in for an rt pcr and large scale testings of the patients can be done so this will help us in isolating these patients and controlling the spread of this in the community so antigen testings have a good use in areas where the pre test probability of having the dirt disease or having the infection is high and these are the references which i have taken thank you thank you thank you very much uh, dr ratnamani uh, thank you dr tandan um, i think uh, there will be some questions about this and we'll of course be taking questions in the end this is a test that has been very useful in india and uh, dr navin dang who uh, serves on an advisory uh, body has been instrumental in our journey in terms of testing over the years uh, for the sars cov2 uh, virus and i think there's been quite an evolution so big thank you anavin for joining and for your constant input uh, we move on to the next session and uh, it's a privilege to introduce dr pallu malawala to moderate the session uh, dr pallu is an ophthalmologist in sydney she is the founder and director of rose hill surgery Uh, she is the current president of the Australian Indian Medical Graduates Association. Uh, she is very actively involved in community health awareness programs and has been instrumental in raising funds for uh, cancer research through organisations like Cancer Council and Cure Cancer Research Foundation Australia. Uh, welcome, uh, Dr. Palu, and over to you to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Prashant Patel. Thank you so much, Anupam. Um, it's it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Prashant Patel. Uh, he's going to talk today on the sero prevalence in health for in the health workforce. Dr. Prashant Patel uh, is working as a consultant in metabolic diseases and chemical pathology at the University Hospitals of Leicester, UK. He is a founding co-director of the National Center for Adherence Testing, which provides test five hypertension centers in the UK and other countries. Dr. Patel has also authored invited chapters in books, published extensively in leading journals, and supervised PhD students. Dr Patel is the director of one of the largest CMGs with more than 3000 staff at university hospitals in Leicester. So he's got very impressive credentials and we are really looking forward to hear you talk Dr Patel. Over to you. Can you hear me? This this very kind introduction. Thank you very much Dr Patel. um i'm just going to try and share these slides uh, uh okay okay can you see the slides yes we can okay thank you very much just go on to slide show yeah. can you uh, okay can you see the slides now yeah perfect go ahead okay thank you right, thank you thank you thanks dr paul and thanks capio for uh, inviting me to share our experience of zero prevalence in uh, um, in healthcare workforce for the antibody testing for covid um these are my declarations uh, this is where i come from uh, uh lester somewhere in the midlands this is how it was before it's changed obviously substantially now and i don't have to remind people that the uh, the, the 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 burden borne by uh, healthcare workers in this humanitarian crisis uh, i think uh, a lot is known uh, now with regards to what sort of risk in general community uh, and individuals people have the chance ethnicity um, uh, being south asian and being the obese and uh, afro caribbean uh, it's increased risk factor for morbidity we still lot to understand what are the risk increased risk for in getting the infection itself and second thing is how is it prevalent in healthcare workers um so there's a need to understand whether zero prevalence differs according to the job roles ethnicity doctors versus nurses 
specialities, uh, that is ED versus radiology, for example, and the seniority and so on. And uh, and the, this is the, this is where we try to um, kind of unpick the answers. At the time when we did the study, there was not many uh, studies uh, out. I think I'm aware that there is a Spanish data which came out a month ago in Lancet, which was a uh, zero prevalence looking at the community, which is around 6%, and there were 500 healthcare workers there, and there was a zero prevalence of 10%, but there was no other further details on it. So this was a prospective observational uh, cohort study looking at the zero prevalence for uh, um, uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, IgG IG, IG in the hospital, uh, acute hospital at our University of Leicester. This is one of the biggest, uh, fourth biggest trust in the country, actually, with the 17,000 employees and around 38% of them being uh, coming from the BAME background. Uh, the antibody testing was largely voluntarily uh, introduced by the government, and it was done between the 29th of May to 29th of June. Uh, the, the reason timing is important is it was around six to seven weeks after the uh, UK had a peak uh, 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 epidemic, uh, so it was uh, an, enough time for people to probably uh, produce antibodies. The only exclusion at the time was people who were actually symptomatic with the disease and people who had the infection confirmed by uh, PCR testing through nasopharyngeal swabbing three weeks uh, before. And the reason that they were advised not to have the test was because uh, in our experiments, for the IgG antibodies to the uh, nucleocapsid caps protein, which was a test for uh, with our but uh, machine, the sensitivity was around 93.5% uh, at, at after three weeks of infection. And if it was any earlier, it was much lower and thought to be unacceptable. Uh, I'm sorry, it's a busy slide, but I think I've highlighted certain things. Uh, this is just a basic demographics. Uh, you can see this around 10,662 uh, healthcare workers participated in the study, um, uh, and then out of that, uh, you know, 65% were white, white population, and 23% uh, were South Asian, and 5% for Afro Caribbean. Um, and the majority of them, as you can see, are women, uh, which is uh, which is actually representative of the workforce in the, in the hospital. And as you can see here, there is a wide range of uh, professions. Uh, uh, like doctors, nurses, uh, therapists, which are called as allied health professionals, pharmacists, administrative people, radiographers, healthcare scientists, and cleaners and porters, they were all uh, rep well represented uh, for, to make it more meaningful. And also, as a speciality, you can see that they, they were well represented. There's ED and acute medicine, uh, general medicine, surgery, pediatrics. So, uh, the, the very wide, varied uh, representation. Obviously, with the 17,000 staff, we had a wide, varied representation. So this is the important slide. Uh, really, I, to make it more uh, concise, I've taken the IG negative uh, um, results. I just put positive ones. So overall, as you can see, um, out of uh, 10, 000, uh, more than 10,000 staff who took part, the, the IG positivity in the acute trust was around 10.8%. Uh, now, um, what was interesting was to see that uh, the uh, the white people, uh, the, the, the positivity was around 9.1%. Uh, uh, South Asians was 12.3%. And then Af uh, Black African was 21.2%. Uh, so there's a definitely increased um, uh, prevalence of this disease. And and the and if you can look at the um, incidence of the disease in healthcare workers, um, it's around 11% for women and around 10% for men. And that was statistically significant. The not having the difference was statistically significant. What I meant was uh, in the in all the healthcare 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 uh, um, uh, assessments we do, ma uh, male gender uh, sort to be an important uh, parameter for uh, mortality. But for the infection, as you can see, there's no much difference between the male and female. If you look at the actual occupation, as you can see, the doctors were around 10.3 percent, and uh, and if you can see the horizontal, um, uh, the, the prevalence of zero positivity in uh, you know, white doctors was around 8.8 percent, uh, and uh, the South Asians were 12 percent, and then the Afro Caribbean was 16.7 percent. So, and the nurses, as you can see, 13.7 percent, which is much higher than doctors, and uh, I think that's probably to do with the persistent. Uh, exposure and for wrong exposure, and again they were actually for quite um, uh, according to ethnicity as well. They were quite uh, representative as well. As you can see, there's one in four uh, nearly would have had the 
disease uh, if you're a, a Arctic Caribbean nurse. Uh, given that there is increased mortality in certain ethnicities, we have to be mindful that they are uh, in, in when we do certain uh, risk assessment with them. Um, other other uh, you know, representative staff, such as, uh, as you can see, the administrative and executive, the lot lawyer, 8.6.8%. Uh, now, the thing I wanted to draw attention was the estate, which is the, largely the uh, porters, cleaners, uh, 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 staff, uh, around 9.7%. So it's not just a clinical staff or patient, face, uh, patient facing, the other group, but also had a high percentage of positivity. So we need to look after them. Two. Um, if we, this is the uh, part two of the same table, looking at the different speciality. As you can see here in general medicine, uh, the positivity was around uh, 11, 17.5%, uh, sorry. Uh, and then again, it was representative across the uh, uh, ethnicities as well. Um, and if you are in a, if you're in a surgery, it's around 12%. Pediatrics was representing the, you know, probably the COVID uh, workload, 5.8%. Radiology and other non-patient facing, directly patient facing were lower at 7%. What intrigued us uh, was the anesthetics and ICU. As you can see, it's quite low at 6.7%. And despite looking after uh, critically unwell patients and they're exposed to uh, aerosol, aerosol generating procedures, it was quite low at 6.7%. I don't think we understand why this, this is uh, this is a picture. Is it to do with, uh, they are quite probably more used to doffing and donning and use of PPEs? Or is it used to, they, they were probably having the FFP3 mask straight away. And uh, when this study was done, the the uh, the, the actual uh, surgical risk and face mask was not mandatory in, in, in UK. Um, so there's another uh, slide which, uh, which is uh, intriguing. Uh, as you can see here, FR1 is equivalent to the first year registrar of uh, first year resident in, in U US uh, or a house officer in, in other countries. Um, the, the positivity rate was, as you can see, at around 26%. Again, we really don't understand. Is it to do with, you know, the right fresh from the medical school? Is it is it they don't understand the importance of PPE or they are not? Is it educational? Is it, an, uh, you know, or is it just that, you know, often they are the one who actually go and see the patient first, the first port of call. Is it that? Or is it the interaction? So we don't know. The infection is not, obviously, infection is probably from the patient, but there is also other sources of infection from the staff, fomite, and other transmissions. So we don't completely understand it. But we, nevertheless, it's important that we look after them. And before we deploy doctors into the people world from the medical school, we really have to educate them about this. Um, and as you can see, as they grow uh, more seniors and they're older, you can see that there was a reducing incidence of the impact of zero problems when they reached the consultant, which was low at 7.7%. So there was a similar uh, kind of, a, uh, you can see the similar structure with the uh, nursing staff as well, with the healthcare assistant, the, the you know, junior most nurses having the highest 15.5%. And when they become matrons or a nurse consultant, they were low at around 10%. So probably also reflects uh, some of the responsibilities the senior people take in an administrative job as they go ahead. This is the uh, last but one slide, just summarizing what we have uh, kind of seen there in the form of a, a multivariate adjusted analysis. As you can see here, if you can, uh, if you say that a Caucasian um, has one, the risk factors for assertion and staff is around 40% more, 1.4, and this was statistically significant. Uh, and for Africa Caribbean, you can see there is nearly two to three times increased risk work uh, as a, 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 a incident of the zero problem. And uh, similarly with the occupation, if you, if you say doctors as one, there's 38% more chance of infection for nurses and, and, and so on. Again, this is a similar picture showing the acute medicine as one. You can see the rest of everybody else is got slightly lower risk of infection. So um, at the time, uh, we, this was the largest study for on a healthcare worker. I believe there is one more study come up in the Lancet Public Health uh, last week. But that's more of a self-reported uh, app-based study rather than zero prevalence. So it's shown that consistently there's an increased zero positivity compared to general population uh, in healthcare workers too. And it's representing the ethnicity. It is uh, also there is certain demographics of this speciality, job roles, and seniority, which are important when we do the risk assessment. So uh, we, I think it's just got implica serious implications and uh, for policymakers to design a holistic and individualized occupational risk assessment. And I've just seen a discuss it from BAPIO, which is much more comprehensive than what we are doing. So these, these information should probably uh, feed it back to them. This is our team, and uh, I thank you for the kind of invitation.
Thanks ever so much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Pillu, and thank you, Dr. Prashant. And we move on to our next session. Uh, and I would like to invite Dr. Ashok Ratan to moderate the session. Uh, Professor Ashok Ratan is a well-known uh, medical microbiologist. Um, he was at the Olive Institute for a long time, and he was uh, the director of the Pan American Health Organization and administered the Central Asian Regional Economic Cooperation Project uh, established by the Asian Development Bank at Port of Spain. He's an advisor to uh, Pathka and Diagnostic uh, Lab. Uh, over to you. Thank Dr. you. I'm done. Thank you very much for your forwarding. Thank you very much, sir. Sorry, sorry if I have. Uh, please go ahead, Dr. Shogar. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Shushmita Roy Chaudhary, who is working as senior consultant pulmonologist at Apollo Hospitals, Calcutta. Dr. Shushmita has more than 18 years of experience and specializes in pulmonary medicine, sleep medicine, allergy, and asthma. Dr. Shushmita is conducting research on metabolomics in interstitial lung disease and airway diseases in collaboration with IIT, Kharagpur, and one initial paper has been published on this research. Dr. Shushmita was tutor at Glasgow University for three years and was examiner for MRCP and has published more than 30 research papers in various peer-reviewed journals. Dr. Shushmita now regularly teaches DNB trainees at Apollo Hospital, Calcutta. Dr. Shushmita was conferred the International Pulmonologist of the Year Award at National Chest Conference in 2018. She will speak on the role of IL-6 in COVID-19 disease. Dr. Shushmita, please. Thank you for your kind introduction. It was interventional pulmonologist, sorry. Um, thank you very much. Um, I think uh, Dr. Prashant Patel, you need to exit the screen so that I can share mine. Yep. Okay. Prashant, please exit. Yeah, uh, go ahead. Okay. One second. Can you see my? Yeah, please go ahead. Go on to slideshow. I'll do that. One second. So I was asked to speak on IL-6 measurement. And because I'm a clinician, I'm just going to go through the, um, reiterate the basics as we go along. Uh, everybody here knows, I'm, I'm sure that it's a glycoprotein, which is not normally secreted by normal cells, but by macrophages, T cells, endothelial cells and fibroblasts and has inflammatory and pro-inflammatory activity and is involved in the production of immunoglobulins, helps in differentiation of B cells, cytotoxic lymphocytes, plasma cells and modulates hematopoiesis and fibrinogen and along with IL-1 and other proteins is found in acute phase of many diseases including infections, inflammation, rheumatological diseases. So in a nutshell, it's a multifunctional cytokine that regulates the immune response, the acute phase reaction, and hematopoietic system activity. And expression is readily induced by various cytokines, lipopolysaccharides, and viral infection. So what is the relation of IL-6 with COVID is what we are here to discuss. So it has been shown over, as our evidence over these 222 days has evolved, that the pro-inflammatory cytokines play a pivotal role in pathophysiology of lung damage. Because influenza-like illness and SARI have two very different outcomes. And it is about the serious acute lung injury that we are worried about. And lots and lots of patients unexplainedly result in fulminant immune reaction, which is mainly sustained by the cytokines. And uh, at autopsy, they've been found to be alveolar infiltration by macrophages and monocytes. And interleukin-6 has been one of the main mediators. And in those presenting with uh, moderate to severe COVID cases, more than about 50% of them have been found to have increased levels. Now, cytokine release sy syndrome has been talked about a lot, and it is a plethora of release of uncontrolled IL-6, IL-1, 12, 18, TNF-alpha, and interferon gamma, 
which increases the alveolocapillary gas exchange, reducing oxygenation in the pulmonary tissue. And here, amongst all of these, the key driver has been found to be interleukin-6 in the hyperinflammatory process, especially in COVID-19. And a meta-analysis initially that was presented by Coombs et al. found that those presenting with complicated COVID had a 2.9-fold high, higher uh, amount of uh, IL-6 compared to those who had uncomplicated COVID infection. So why is it important? Because not only pathologically it depicts an inflammatory response, clinically it correlates with respiratory failure. In those patients who have IELTS, higher IL-6 have been found to be progressing to intubation and mechanical ventilation, and it has direct correlation with mortality. And ARDS in some patients with COVID, despite decreasing viral loads, has been worsening and has been suggested that and there's an exaggerated host immune response and a lot of these patients have been found to have raised interleukin-6. And the evidence, the largest one that was provided uh, was a meta-analysis of 1,426 patients. All of these were Chinese. And the mean interleukin-6, which is usually, you know, it has various labs have various values and there's a circadian rhythm of IL-6 values, which can be one to five in normal circumstances, was found to be 56 picograms per ml in the severe group compared to 17 picograms per ml in the non-severe group. And meta-regression analysis showed that high interleukin-6 levels were related to increased mortality. And when you, this was a scatter plot, which shows there's a direct relation there. And if you forest plot it, you can see that in the severe ones, compared to the non-severe ones, the IL-6 values were much higher, more than 55. And most studies hence took 55 as a cutoff. Now, Another study, this was an Italian study of 77 patients from different hospitals that was taken, showed that the area under the curve for IL-6 as a predictor for mortality was quite significant. Also, when risk factors for combined endpoint progression to severe COVID-19 or in-hospital mortality was taken, the logistic regression analysis, apart from other risk factors as age, comorbidity, the Cal score, D-dimer levels found that IL-6 of more than 25, so this was way lower than 55, had a higher progression to endpoint progression of severe COVID and in-hospital mortality. So the study takeaway here was that it's a good prognosticator of combined endpoint progression to severe disease and inpatient mortality. And the study supported the use of anti-IL-6 drugs uh, to target cytokine storm as a valid therapeutic option with supportive strategies. But when you come down to ground level, there's a lot going on and a lot of talk going on about anti-IL-6 drugs. Very importantly, before we assess or interpret our in IL-6 values, few things have to be taken into consideration. The first thing is not every hospital has, has the ability to uh, you know, do IL-6 levels in-house. So they might have to outsource it. So it's extremely important that it's sent in a plasma vial, which is a yellow top gel vial. And it must be performed within four hours because beyond that, with every hour, the level of uh, IL-6 spuriously increases. Therefore, these put, if a blood sample has been outsourced and if it's not done within four hours, the level of IL-6 might be spuriously high. That has to be remembered. And labs definitely must have an honest and clear sample rejection criteria, especially for this test. And normal IL-6 levels, again, I reiterate, do not exclude inflammation, do not exclude cytokine storm. So lots of people depend upon IL-6 as IL-6 values to give anti-IL-6 treatment. But as lots of other evidence has shown, that normal IL-6 values do not exclude inflammation. So if I were to summarize whatever little I've learned about IL-6 in these 200, 200 odd days, that it is a key driver of hyperinflammatory process of COVID-19. Meta-analysis has found that there's 2.9-fold higher levels in complicated COVID compared to uncomplicated ones. So one at admission, and if the patient's oxygenation levels in ARDS is worsening, a repeat, if there's a rising trend, then it gives you a chance that anti-IL-6, whether you're going to be treating that patient with anti-IL-6, Current evidence shows that it's a good prognosticator of progression to severe disease and adverse outcomes. And IL-6 inhibitors appear to be efficacious in preliminary investigation, although recent uh, reports like the Covactor trial, etc., have given mixed results to, the, to define you know, what is the value of anti-IL-6-like 
tocilizumab, etc., but cellulizumab, etc., studies are ongoing. And I think there is some more time to wait for to find out whether routine application of these will be useful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Sushmita. Thank you, Dr. Ratan. We move on to the next session. Uh, I'd like to invite Dr. Raman Sardana. Ram Raman is the Senior Consultant, Head of Microbiology and Academic Advisor for Lab Services at Apollo Hospital, Delhi. He's the Head of the Infection Control uh, uh, Program and Chairperson of the Hospital Infection Control Committee. He's uh, been very actively involved with the Hospital Infection Control uh, Society of India. Over to you, Raman, to introduce Dr. Ram Subramaniam from Chennai. Namaste, everyone. And uh, serology, as we know, has uh, has uh, been the uh, 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 has played a very pivotal role uh, throughout um, the diagnosis of diseases where uh, organisms were difficult to culture or not at all uh, discernible, uh, especially in the pre-molecular age uh, era, and um, we are still foxed by the serological uh, evidences that we get in various uh, infectious diseases and more so with, uh, more so with uh, something like COVID. Um, when, how, which ones, whether it's a combination which is going to work, uh, what is the significance, is it uh, a, a, a something like which tells us a, a reassurance on reinfection and other things, what exactly is the meaning. So all these, uh, I think, would be dealt uh, by uh, Dr. Ram Sulamaniam, uh, a great friend, and uh, also uh, it's, it's good to uh, so good to introduce you once again. Uh, Ram has been uh, he has done his uh, post graduation from uh, PGI Chandigarh, and uh, he works as everyone knows, uh, most of you would know in fact as a senior consultant in infectious diseases, HIV, and tropical medicine at Apollo Chennai. And uh, he got trained in IV and uh, HIV in UK after getting his MRCP and obtain a diploma in tropical medicine and hygiene from uh, London School uh, of Tropical Medicine. And uh, he is also happens to be an adjunct professor of infectious diseases at Sri Ramchandra Institute of Higher Education and Research, um, uh, Savita Medical College, Apollo Hospitals Education Research Foundation, and MGR Medical University, Chennai. Over to you, Ram. So many things I want to talk about you, uh, but time doesn't permit that way. Thank you very much, Raman, for those kind words. Uh, I have been asked to talk to you about uh, COVID serology. And uh, for any disease, the diagnosis is very important, especially so for any pandemic. This is both to diagnose patients, this is to identify the contacts and check them out, and also to screen at-risk populations and check the effectiveness of the control strategy. So. Tests are important, but unfortunately, not all tests are scalable and affordable. If you look at the client requirements in most situations, they are way beyond the client budget. So even though the gold standard is the RT-PCR, because of the expense and because of the time involved, we need to look at alternatives to ensure that we can screen our patients better. We need to understand that the serology helps to determine if the individual was ever infected before. In other words, he shows the presence of antibodies. It is not recommended for acute infections because it is detectable only one to three weeks after the onset of symptoms. Even though antibodies can be detected as early as five days, generally it is more reliable beyond two weeks. Please understand that this is not used to determine if the individual is immune. So the concept of immunity passports is still questionable. There is no significant advantage in the various assays we check for the specific immunoglobulin class, whether it is IgG, IgM, or total. We still don't know whether it makes any difference at all. It is very important that we choose tests with high sensitivity and specificity. And in the absence of such a situation, you need to do what is called as orthogonal testing, which is a sequence of two assays in succession with different methodologies. If one comes positive, the same sample is repeated with another test to ensure that it is truly positive. It is useful for diagnosis of persons presenting late or with complications, typically the multi-system inflammatory syndrome, which is seen in pediatrics, which the child presents after two to three weeks. It is useful in that situation. We still do not know how long the antibody persists, and we are still not 
having clarity about the correlation of antibodies and the protection they offer. If you look at the course of the infection and look at the serology or the production of antibodies, you will find that the nasopharyngeal swab, which detects the, the genetic elements of the virus through PCR, is the earliest one to remain positive, along with the culture of virus in the respiratory tract. This happens even a couple of days before the onset of symptoms. The IgG and the IgM antibodies will start usually after day five, typically around the 10th or the 11th day. And then it may, the IgM antibodies survive only for a few weeks. As of now, the information we have gathered and the IgG antibodies probably a little longer. If you look at the antibody responses, it is it SARS or the SARS-CoV-2 is a little bit of a, an outlier in the sense that not typically it is always the IgM which is produced initially. The antibodies are produced against the, the nucleocapsid uh, protein and the spike, anti, spike antigen. So these are the two antibodies. These two are believed to have neutralization properties. And you look at the occurrence of the antibodies. In some situations, the IgG happens to be produced much earlier than the IgM. This is with regard to both anti-nucleocapsid protein and the anti-spike protein. And the serum antibody levels do not correlate with severity or the protection ability. So even between mild and severe cases, there is no direct correlation between the level of the titer of antibodies produced. In general, the antibodies, as, as I said earlier, start to be produced about five days after the onset of symptoms. And the zero conversion for IgM is around 10 to 13 days. For IgG, it is about 12 to 14 days. The maximum zero conversion happens between two to three weeks for IgM and three to six weeks for IgG. The peak again happens somewhere in four to six weeks time and probably around the same time for IgG. And as of current studies, the duration of antibody persistence is believed to be eight weeks for probably both. When you compare this with the SARS coronavirus 1, which was 20 years ago, the antibodies seem to peak in the third month and last for up to a year. But in this, we are still learning about the response of the antibodies. If you look at the testing, the antibodies produced against the spike glycoprotein and the nucleocapsid phosphoprotein are both believed to be neutralizing in their ability. The types of antibodies that is, we either detect the binding antibody or the neutralizing antibody. The binding antibody detection is a little easier because it is a test which is done using purified protein antigens from the virus and does not need a high level of biosafety level. So it can be done in BSL-2 uh, laboratories. There are two types amongst the binding antibody detection. The point of care testing, which is something like a pregnancy test, which is done on a card, which is typically using a lateral flow assay is less sensitive compared to the other test. And the laboratory-based tests, which use the ELISA or the chemiluminescence immunoassay, are believed to be, they are all rapid tests. The, even the lab tests are pretty rapid, but you need a lab backup. And they are believed to be more sensitive and specific when compared to the lateral flow assay. The lateral flow assay typically uses whole blood, whereas there is a differentiation in the ELISA and the CLIA tests. If you are using tests to detect neutralizing antibodies, that means you need to have a higher biosafety level because you can use either a virus neutralization test where the serum is incubated with cells to detect the plaque reduction, or you can also have a pseudovirus neutralization test using a, a, a pseudovirus like a, a, a variola virus where you look at the uh, plaque reduction using the uh, neutralization test in this situation. These require a higher level of biosafety. We are also now look, gathering information that probably the maturity of the antibody also plays a role and targeting mature antibodies may be beneficial in increasing the testing specificity. So it is believed that the mature antibodies not only recognize the virus better, but also effectively neutralize. So detection of these mature antibodies probably will be more beneficial when compared to the protein screening of antibodies. This test looked at the, this was a meta-analysis, which looked at the various studies currently available using the different methodologies, the ELISA, the lateral flow, and the CLIA methodologies. It included 40 studies and over close to 30,000 tests. 
and it found that the lateral flow assay, the simple point of care test, has the had the least positive predictive value, about 66% only. The ELISA and the CLI had a better positive predictive value. Um, and similarly, in patients without COVID, also the net negative predictive value was better with the laboratory based test. They found that there was a significant uh, difference or a heterogeneity in the various tests, and it would made it difficult to standardize or make it generalize the point of care testing and outpatient population testing in these using these tests. So the selection of tests based on the sensitivity and specificity is very important. This table very clearly illustrates if you have a prevalence of one and you use a test which has a sensitivity of 99% and the specificity of 99%, the positive predictive value can be as low as 50%. In other words, 50% of tests which show a positive result may actually be false positive. But as the prevalence increases, when it go to 10% of prevalence, the same sensitivity and the specificity can produce a positive predictive value of as high as 92%. So it is very important to choose the set test with a higher sensitivity and a specificity, especially when you have a low prevalence or, as I said earlier, use the orthogonal testing methodology whereby you repeat the test in a, with, an other, uh, with another test so that you can get a more specific answer. The different testing strategies include choosing a test with high specificity, Focus on persons with a high pretest probability, typically presenters who come late after symptom onset, or include the orthogonal testing algorithm. It can also be used for as a rapid triage for symptomatic individuals, testing contacts of confirmed patients where the pretest probability would be higher. It can these serological tests can be used for convalescent plasma screening, especially for uh, you know trials going on right now. There is some role of these serological tests in travel and probably more importantly in assessing the herd immunity for community surveillance. They have also been used for workforce screening, but uh, a well-accepted validated algorithm is still uh, not yet available. What is more important is when a serology is not recommended, it is not to be used in the early part of an acute infection should be avoided in situations where the prevalence of the infections is low, should not be used for healthcare workers to assess whether they can return to work, what I told you earlier as an immunity passport, should not be used to test patients who are getting discharged from hospitals to see whether they are no longer infectious. We need to understand the limitations because we are still unaware of the kinetics of the antibody response, the longevity of the antibodies and the protection it offers, the specific titer where protection is afforded and also the correlation between the titer and the nature of protection. There is also some cross reactivity with other coronaviruses based on some testing uh, tests which are available. It is believed that the spike protein, the antibodies against the spike protein are more reliable and less likely to cross react with other coronaviruses. The methodology and the sensitivity also is quite varied between different tests available. So I leave you with this slide. There is still a lot to learn. You know, there are tall claims coming from various companies regarding testing methodologies. But I think till we have definite validated and approved tests, I think we should still be careful in what tests we use and probably rely more on, you know, uh, tests which have stood the, the scrutiny of uh, time and uh, experimentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ram, and thank you very much, Raman. We move on to the last talk, and then we're going to have a Q&A. Uh, and uh, it's a pleasure to invite uh, Dr. Rajesh Chavla to moderate the last session. Rajesh is a senior consultant in respiratory critical care medicine at Apollo Hospital, Delhi. He's a past president of the Indian Society of Critical Care and uh, the National College of Test Physicians. He's a former chancellor of the Indian College of Critical Care Medicine. Over to you, uh, Raman, to introduce Dr. Manoj. Uh, sorry, Rajesh, to introduce Manoj. Thank you, Anupam. Hi, everyone. You know, we have heard about the tests so far available. So now we are going to hear what will be available and what is in store for us. So I have a great pleasure in introducing Dr. Manoj Jain, who has received his engineering public health degree and doctorate from Boston University. He got trained from the Harvard School of Public Health. Dr. Manoj is an infectious disease consultant and a clinical associate professor at University of Tennessee 
Memphis and Rollins School of Public Health at Emory University of Atlanta. Dr. Jain is an advisor to state government and World Health Organization on COVID-19 and earlier served as a consultant to the World Bank on HIV. Dr. Jain is a writer, a national leader in healthcare quality improvement and published numerous scientific articles, chapters and books. So let's see if we something new coming up, which is going to be useful in managing these patients. Over to you, Manoj. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, it is indeed humbling and a, a pleasure to, to be with this esteemed group of folks. Um, uh, it is unreal what we are going through. Uh, and it is actually uh, uh, a credit to GAPIO and API and all of the organizations that you are doing uh, to bring information to the point of care, which are the doctors and over 500 who are with us. So uh, I want to, as the cleanup batter here, uh, someone in baseball that we say who's sort of uh, uh, hitting last, I sort of bring a lot of the diagnoses, the questions, issues that we've uh, come up with and put them together and then see what's coming up next. So the, some of the key questions when the idea of questioning comes, uh, testing comes up, is are you doing, are we doing this as a diagnostic test, screening test, or surveillance test? That makes all the world of difference. We also need to uh, ask, as we've heard, is this for a past test or a present test uh, infection that we're looking for? We have to begin to ask of the three, three types, the PCR antibody antigen, and then who to test, the symptom, symptomatic contacts or asymptomatics, what type of swab to use, what techniques that we can use, which I'll go into in more detail, and the newer techniques that are available. Also, are we administrating to this test at the home or in uh, the clinic or workplace, the cost of the test, and how good is the test, the sensitivity, specificity, specificity, and lastly, uh, will uh, patients accept or not? I'm going to dwell on a couple of these points. We have discussed this in detail today, uh, PCR test, antibody test, and antigen test. Uh, the gold standard being the PCR in the U.S. costing over $100 to $150. Uh, the antigen test costs about $20 and the antibody is $35, and we know their limitations. One of the critical questions as a public health person that I ask uh, advising the mayor here and also the governor uh, is, are we doing these tests for a diagnostic purpose, meaning individual one-on-one? -on -one? Are we doing it as screening, like we're talking about, is in the school setting and universities, which we're thinking of screening in order to open, or is it a more surveillance type where we don't uh, provide individual data, but population-based data? Because there's a lot of leniency by the FDA and the CDC on when we do a surveillance test. We just had a call uh, yesterday with the CDC and they gave us guidance on what you could use as a surveillance test. And I think that those apply to other places as well. And then, the broader question, the PCR testing, in terms of uh, looking at it as a symptomatic or a close contact or an asymptomatic. Why does this matter? Is because the positivity rate will be very different in these three populations. So if you're doing large scale testing, need to know that the symptomatics may be five to 10% or more positivity, close contacts may be five to 10%, and the asymptomatics may be less than 1%. I want to make a comments on a couple of areas uh, before going into the depths of new tests because I think all of this matters significantly. What type of a swab are we using? We've heard about the various swabs. Generally, the nasopharyngeal has been the gold standard, but we've been doing the nasal swab, which has a fairly good sensitivity, about 95%, and the, one of the best is the mid turbinate, which has had a pretty good uh, sensitivity and specificity, as you see. This is from the IDSA Society recommendations and would really encourage folks to think more on the nasal swabs, 
which is something that we've started to do when we're doing asymptomatic testing, uh, which is the mid-turbinate swab uh, for our firefighters, for our children at school. And saliva testing. This is coming up as one of the new tests. Uh, one of the companies called Vault Health has a very simple mail-in program, about $150 uh, dollars video monitored, couple of days turnaround time. Now, what are the new and upcoming uh, techniques uh, for testing and different types of tests? One is something called pool testing. What this allows us to do is to expand the number, the volume of tests that one can do. So about two months ago, after having learned uh, this technique for TB in India, and I, I believe of many folks in, in India and China have been doing this, but not as much in in US. Uh, I I went to my uh, mayor and my expert panel and said, let's do a pool testing strategy to go from a thousand to ten thousand uh, capacity in our city. Uh, the New York Times covered our story and in detail. But basically, what it means is instead of doing three or five individual tests, you put them into one. Uh, basically. If you have a low sensitivity, excuse me, low uh, positivity rate, uh, one of those may come up positive, and then you test those individually. And that saves a lot of individual testing, not having to test all of these samples uh, testing. I, I would really encourage those who have uh, not started doing this for their pre-ops and for others to talk to their laboratory director and to do that. We're using this to open up our schools and universities. In the US, it does require an FDA emergency use authorizations. A positivity rate has to be low. Otherwise, you don't get the advantage of pool testing that you would. It can be done on a Roche Cobas machine, the Panther Thermal Fisher. And like I said, the capacity expands exponentially and it makes a huge difference in your lab being able to do a large population. Other newer uh, techniques and tests. A number of point of care tests are available. One that we've heard about the Abbott, uh, the Cepheid and others. These are PCR based and have a fairly good sensitivity and specificity. We are using some of them. The White House uses the Abbott. We also use that. You know, uh, there has been controversy as to what the sensitivity is, is uh, for this test, uh, but generally it's accepted to be fairly high. The NIH is taking a very approach in encouraging new types of tests. So they have a program called the Rapid Accelerator for Diagnostics, over $1.5 billion to a number of companies. And here are some of the successes, or at least the, the ones that are uh, taking uh, this uh, support. Uh, Ginkgo Labs in Boston, Helix in California, and others in California as well. And they're using this new techniques called next generation sequencing, as well as the CRISPR. Let me take a minute and explain to you what those some of those techniques are and what the potential that they hold. What the next generation the, the next generation sequencing does is a high uh, allows for a high volume uh, of samples to be done. Through, uh, uh, with throughput with DNA sequencing. Uh, it employs, uh, it employs uh, micro and nanotechnologies. Just over a month ago, uh, it, uh, one of the companies has been given a FDA approval uh, to uh, uh, do an EUA on it, but not to begin clinical testing. Uh, it can do over 3,000 swabs in a run. It is exquisitely sensitive. Uh, but it has a turnaround time of over uh, 48 hours, but the cost can be reduced. The present PCR test is about $100. This can go down to less than $20 uh, with a very low number of copies uh, there, uh, high sensitivity and specificity of 98 and 97%. What CRISPR is, is essentially uh, a way of uh, doing what we call word processing uh, on uh, being a scissors for the DNA. It can be done through a desktop instrument uh, using either saliva or a swab. Uh, 
several companies are uh, doing this has a very high uh, sensitivity specificity and the cost can be exceedingly low. So these two technologies keep an eye out. We're going to be seeing uh, something come up. So in summary, uh, we've heard about the basic testing uh, types, the uh, uh, PCR, the antibody antigen, with the other ones that are uh, coming up. We really have to keep our population in mind. Uh, we have to really think about uh, the new techniques. I would encourage you to think about pool testing. Uh, there's a great deal of data from Israel and Germany on this. We have taken it up with great success, especially with our low uh, uh, positivity groups such as pre-ops and screening children and the newer technologies for NextGen and CRISPR. So with that, I want to finish and thank you uh, uh, for the opportunity to, to talk. Thank you so much, Manoj, and thank you so much, Rajesh. And we now move on to the Q&A. And we've got uh, two stellar uh, experts to handle that. We've got Dr. Sunita Naredi, who's uh, American board certified in internal medicine and infectious diseases and a senior consultant in infectious diseases at Apollo Health City, Hyderabad. Uh, expertise includes nosocomial infection, infections in immunocompromised hosts, HIV, uh, multi drug resistant tuberculosis. Sai Praveen uh, Harnath is a pulmonologist and critical care specialist, a senior consultant at Apollo Health City Hyderabad. He's American board certified in internal medicine, pulmonary medicine, critical care. He's also the medical director of the Apollo E Access Tele ICU services. So over to Sunita and, and Sai, and uh, we want you to wrap up in 15 minutes, please. Well, great. Thank you, Anupam. My audio check. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Great, great. Sunita and me have been uh, in the background kind of collating some other questions. Uh, exceptional participation by the uh, people who are attending, all 430 of you asking great questions. I'm actually going to start right at the bottom. The, one of the most recent questions was a very practical one. You've talked about all kinds of tests. A dentist is asking, what do I need to do to restart my practice? What test do I pick up? So I'm going to the panel and request uh, Dr. Aram and Dr. Sushmita to kind of weigh in uh, very briefly on what would be a practical way to pick a test to say, how do we go forward? And then we'll get into the details of each test. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll take it this first. Um, actually, there is no specific screening for going back to practice. I know there are a lot of physicians and surgeons and some of them, several of them senior physicians over the age of 60 who are concerned about the risk they may suffer when going back to practice, but there is no foolproof test. The only advice I give anyone is <laughs> consider every patient as COVID positive. So routinely screening all patients is not of any use. The surgeons screen all uh, elective cases to see whether the person could be asymptomatic and positive, more to determine the prognosis of the surgical outcomes rather than for infection control purposes. The, the, the approach would be to treat everybody as positive and take appropriate precautions. At least a basic minimum is necessary. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, Sunita, would you like to address? Um, no. Yeah. I, I, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Sushmita. Oh, Sunita, did, were you going to say or just me? No, Sushmita, go ahead. All right. Okay. So, no, I completely agree with uh, Ram. I think there is a specific test that we would ask. A lot of our colleagues do come back and say, I need to start my dental practice, my ENT practice, and I'm going to be going to be very close to a patient. Should I, from time to time, do my RT-PCR? But unless there's any symptoms and if they're taking proper precautions, there aren't any tests that suggest they do. Great. Thank you. Sunita, go ahead with that earlier question. Uh -huh. Uh, the next question I have is for uh, anybody, but uh, what are the factors or pitfalls that can interfere with the testing or may result in the misinterpretation of results? Dr. Nickel, do you want to take this? What are the factors or pitfalls that can interfere with the testing or may result in misinterpretation of results? Right. So, I mean, the biggest challenge we have seen um, early on in the illness that has been a pitfall in diagnosing, um, especially with the rapid testing. Um, that is one of the biggest pitfalls we have seen. So that's why we initially, in the beginning, we were using serologic testing. But then once we had built up our PCR platforms, 
Now we heavily rely on the PCR platforms. So I think one of the biggest the drawbacks I've seen is that early on in the illness, when you're not able to achieve an adequate cycle threshold and amplify the virus, you know, you tend to see false negative testing, and that's one of the major drawbacks. Uh, thank you. Uh, next question is to, to Dr. Ratnamani. Uh, is there any possibility of kits made in India coming and their global acceptance in terms of reliability? Dr. Ratnamani, are you there? Okay. Um, anyone else can answer this question? Sunita. Yeah. Yes, Sunita. So your question was whether any are there any kits uh, uh, made in India coming and the global acceptance in terms of reliability? Uh, presently, I think some work is being done on the automated PCR method, which will act as a point of care testing, something like the one which the Abbott has is there in the US. There is work going on that. And other than that, the uh, one antigen test which has already come into the market uh, from my labs. But uh, beyond that, no, nothing else presently. Except for the automated PCR, which will be total point of data, which is being uh, looked at by some companies. Sai, go ahead. Sure. So uh, there was a bunch of for Patel, zero problem study. Uh, we'll have to keep to the questions that were asked about why did the uh, junior docs get it? What consultants got it? What was the reason for the ethnic differences? Can you kind of, you know, fast some of these topics and kind of suggest that? The other question with that was the UK power rate was pretty high. And, you know, what, what was the reason for that? If you want to kind of postulate on that for a minute or so, it'd be great. So let's talk to Patel. Uh, Mr. Patel, you on uh, mute? Okay, I'm going to skip and go to the next one. Uh, we'll get back to Dr. Patel once he gets back on. Uh, the last speaker uh, had given some very interesting topics on uh, the newer tests. I'm sure some of you, this is a question I'm asking. Many of you saw the Emirates ad where they had dogs sniffing up the patient. Is that a real thing, Doctor? Uh, th that's a good question, and I honestly don't know. I, I, I also saw uh, some uh, information on that, uh, but from the NIH CDC uh, documentation, I have not seen any of that. So, uh, I, but a as you know, sometimes some of those uh, agencies can be behind. So I, I would, I would uh, always have uh, begun to question, and this is actually a overarching. Uh, uh, phenomena that I have seen over the past 220 days that we have all learned from is that many a times even our most knowledgeable agencies such as ICMR, CDC, NIH, uh, WHO, uh, they are slow to react. Uh, we as clinicians on the ground uh, need to be reacting and we did the same thing with uh, putting uh, masking for our healthcare workers about uh, two to three weeks before uh, the recommendation came out, both from the CDC and WHO. So uh, we it's, we will see what that comes out to. So I don't know the details on that. Okay, thanks, Dr. Jen. I want to take this one minute. I think there's a group from Israel who were testing along with Sir Gangaram Hospital. They were testing a nasal based test, which would be looking at. Uh, at volatile fatty acids and make the diagnosis in one minute's time. Yeah, I mean, they've, I think they've done this uh, study and uh, and several hospitals. I think we await the data. That's quite exciting work. They've also been looking at nanoparticles and, and certain frequencies to pick up uh, rapidly. It'll be very interesting that, that data should be out there. Thanks, Anupam. Thanks, uh, Dr. Rathan. Uh, one other question somebody had a question. Somebody had an antibody test that comes positive, then they end up with symptoms and getting readmitted. Do you do a repeat RT-PCR on these patients? Ram, do you want to take that the practical question? Yeah, this is a little uh, confusing in the sense these patients recover and then subsequently have another episode warranting hospitalization, either they become breathless or have increasing fever. Now, there is no test which will help us at this time because 
the antibody I suspect will definitely be positive in most people if you do use the correct uh, kit. And the antigen may be positive because as we know, they cough up the dead antigen from the pulmonary tissue and the antigen, the antigen or the RT-PCR may be positive. So I think there is no way to definitively prove unless you do viral cultures, which is not commercially available as yet. So this will always be a mystery. There has been a recent French study where they looked at about, I think, 12 people who had reinfections and then tested positive. But I don't think we have definitive proof uh, that, uh, you know, the reinfection happens and we can identify without viral cultures. I'll just add to that. This is Manoj. A very good point. I agree, Ram. And uh, one of the ways that we've been having conversations of looking at this gene sequencing as well and to see if it's the same uh, virus or is this a new virus that has come in, and that will be very ha uh, helpful. And in the newer tests, some of the, my lab people tell me that uh, the next generation sequencing can be very helpful in that uh, as well. There is some evidence that uh, in these patients, there's subgenomic RNA. It's not the virus. It is not the persistent of the virus, but subgenomic messenger RNA, which is associated with the membrane. And that's why it's more stable. But this can be detected. In South Korea, when they investigated, they found that there was no chance of recurrence. Thanks, Dr. Ratan. Uh, Ram, one more question somebody had for you was the IgG to the spike or the nucleocapsid, which one's better? Can we even make out the difference? Somebody with yes, uh, you can. Uh, the spike one antibody to the spike protein is believed to have less cross-reactivity with other coronaviruses uh, when compared to the nucleocapsid. So uh, it is believed the spike is uh, better, technically. Here See, Definitely, spike is the best because spike, the receptor binding site of the spike binds to the ACE2 receptor. So it's like the like the dagger. If you have antibodies to the dagger, you're protected. And there is in the disorin uh, kit, you'll find that it is reflected onto neutralizing antibodies. And neutralizing antibodies will be protective. But of course, antibodies are a double-edged sword. So we should be careful. Okay, thank you, yeah. Dr. These antibodies have, from diazorin also, uh, they detect against both the components of uh, spike protein, S1 and S2. So that is another big thing because it doesn't miss out. That's one thing. And they have been titrated against uh, the plaque reduction assays as well. So there's a good study which has come from Italy on that. So I, I think that, uh, uh, yes, as we progress in the pandemic, we'll see more and more uh, role for neutralizing antibodies. Great. Thanks, Thanks Dr. Raman. Uh, clearly, there's a lot of interest in experts on this. We all have a, a whole separate web antibody. So now, one question I had, uh, I think we'll hand it over in a second, but one of the other questions I had was in terms of uh, the uh, testing strategy. So what we have heard, many of the questions have been answered in the chat box. Earlier on, there were a lot of detailed discussions, CBNAT, et cetera. Please look through that if you can. The other big thing was there were a lot of clinical questions. I'm not addressing those with lack of time, including when do you use anti-IL-6? When do you think of vaccine? We're not addressing that in this particular webinar, but these are very important questions. And if you can email GAPQ, I'm sure we can with more detailed answers. Um, yeah, there are a lot of very interesting questions here, and uh, uh, some of them not relevant to the topic as well, but a couple of questions, if any of you want to take this. In uh, PIMS, the pediatric inflammatory syndrome, what is there any additional role of CSF biomarkers or anti autoantibodies in the pediatric population? Uh, is there a role of antibody titer to, uh, in assessing pediatric prognosis? Uh, Ram or Sushmita, any of you want to take this? Role of biomarkers in pediatric population? Uh, in in the, the uh, inflammatory syndrome, multi-system inflammatory syndrome is believed to be an immunological reaction. So I don't think there is a role for, at least intuitively speaking, there is no role for uh, inflammatory markers in this, at least, uh, you know, uh, molecular markers in this. Whether inflammatory markers are of any benefit, I'm not sure. Unfortunately, I'm not a pediatrician, so I've not seen any case, but uh, I, I pass. Yeah, same here. I wouldn't be able to answer this question at all. 
Actually, I've seen very limited uh, cases. When I say we are the Apollo Group, and I'm talking about Bombay, Chennai, Delhi, or of this entity, and the biomarkers don't really have much of a role to play. I mean, that's that's what uh, the consensus seems to be emerging here. Uh, so, except except for uh, procalcitonin and uh, CRP, they have been extensively used, uh, also serially. So definitely, obviously, PCD is is pretty high, very very high in um, such cases, as is expected. Um, uh, these two have been used in uh, uh, you know very limited experience. So uh, especially as uh, uh, the child improves, well, what we are seeing is a definite fall and very drastic fall in uh, CRP levels. Ah. Uh. Slightly deviating from the topic that we are having, what about vaccines? When will they be available? Can we uh, that that we will have some vaccines that we can work with? Well, I mean, I've, I've just finished a seminar uh, on on vaccinology um, from with the Chennai International Center a few hours ago, uh, and I just did a review yesterday. So I think we will have uh, in the next couple of months two vaccines in India. It seems like one Indian, one foreign. uh i don't know how much of it will be available uh, nobody is obviously willing to give a definite date but i think most of this will go to the government will go for in all probability armed forces and so on uh and uh, i think early next year we going to get a fair number and by middle of next year i think we will be spoiled for choice uh i mean the the capacity that we are talking about serum institute is talking about 10 crore vaccines a month and bharat biotech is talking about 5 crores a month So we are looking at 160 crores in 12 months. Of course, uh, what uh, I mean, Bharat Biotech will perhaps also export a bit, but largely for India, Serum Institute has to export 50%. So it'll be very interesting. But I, I think this space is going to be really uh, alive in, in the next couple of months as the approvals come through. That's that's great information, Ankur. Thank you. That's great. Here, it's great here. So one uh, quick thing that uh, so they had a question for uh, the uh, the nickel. In the, one of the questions was: Is the RT PCR and the CB NAT? Can you re-summarize what the difference is? There were about seven eight questions because I think they're all confused with the acronym. So my understanding is these are all point of care tests. Uh, uh, nickel, do you mind just quickly summarizing what the gist of your talk in terms of the terminology? let me help him then if he is not there uh, cb nat stands for cartridge based nucleic acid amplifying test this is the one that is used in cifet where you just have to put in the the sample it's a closed system while the rt pcr is an open system so cb nat will give you results faster but the principle is rt pcr Thanks, Dr. Rathan. That's helpful. Sunita, you want to add a comment on that? So, uh, uh, basically, the same thing. In India, we have we use primarily TrueNat. Uh, we don't have C uh, Gene Expert available readily in most places. Uh, Safed, I think, is primarily using it for the Western parts of the world. Uh, so, uh, the advantage with uh, Safed's Gene Expert versus TrueNat is that uh, Gene Expert can be used as a point of care test, whereas TrueNat still needs to be. You need to do a, some amount of cartridge uh, RNA extraction, so it's lab-based test. Um, so it's not a point of care test. When you're talking about point of care from the US standpoint of view, you're talking about expert. Uh, when you're talking about point of care testing in India, you're talking about antigen. Uh, uh, CBNAT is as good as uh, PCR, whereas Antigen sensitivity is low, but the specificity is good. So, if you're specific, if you're doing an antigen and it is positive, you rest assured it is positive. You don't have to do anything further. If it is negative, then you have to do a confirmatory test by the PCR, either a true net or an RT PCR, which is available in the set set up. Um, Sai and uh, Sai and Sunita, we will have to wind up. So, I I think I'm going to leave it to you to just wind this up now. Thanks. I take over and finish. Just uh, one more question to Sushmita. Sushmita, you know the IL-6 level. People are all really hung up about what is the number. But what I recently saw was an article saying that even in regular ARDS, IL-6 shoots up much higher than what you see in Corona. So really, the treatment can be always based on IL-6, or is there something else that you want to add on that point? And then we'll close out. 
Yeah, so so we do find a lot of patients come in, you know, they're not that unwell, but their IL-6 would be very high. Three things we definitely do when the patient comes in and we suspect their early respiratory failure or at risk of being uh, um, worsening ARDS. So we send ferritin, we send CRP and a procalcitonin. Lots of patients can, especially in our part of the world, do present with mixed bacterial infection and there the IL-6 levels are high. Along with that, if the procal is high, there we would think twice about giving them any anti-IL-6 treatment. Therefore, for baseline IL-6 with the procalcitonin, ferritin and a CRP is what we do. And then we monitor if the patient is worsening with hypoxia, if they're worsening with increased oxygen requirement, then we would, if they have baseline normal IL-6 values, we would repeat, it, repeat the IL-6. Along with that, we would repeat CRP as well. Perfect. Thank you so much. So I think we'll close the Anupam as you requested. So we've run through RT-PCR CBNX. It's from Nikhil. We had talked about Ratna talking about the antigen test, the seroprevalence by Dr. Patel. We talked about serology with Ram, the newer test with Dr. Jane. And we had a contribution from all the moderators. And I think you're still a great unknown, but we had really great input from every speaker. Thank you all. Thank you, Sunita, for hosting this with me. Anupam, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sunita. Thank you, Sai. Uh, big thank you to everyone who stayed connected. Uh, we did hit 554 just on a number of participants just on this platform. And this, of course, goes on to multiple platforms. So we'll know by tomorrow how many we had. Uh, but it's been uh, wonderful interacting with everyone. Great learning experience. Big thank you to our faculty, to all the speakers, to all the moderators. Uh, and uh, it's time to say bye, and we will uh, reconnect again. Thanks ever so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.